How did you get into filmmaking? After my first two plays opened in New York in the early 70s, I began to get offers to write for television and film. And at the time, I thought, no, I'm way too good to write for film or television. Theater is a far purer art form than either of those. And then I began to be offered so much money that I would have been a lunatic not to accept those offers, which I did. And by the late 70s, I was pretty much splitting my time between working in film, working in theater, loved them both, very different writing forms and equally challenging. You were fortunate enough to work with some recognizable and talented actors in this film. What was an advantage that you saw in working with them, especially in one of your first directorial debuts? Well, my partner Ginger Perkins and I, we don't remember who threw the name out, but when we were starting to make a list of actors, we said, uh, one of us, Linda Hamilton. And we thought, all right, let's, yes, absolutely. Let's give that a try. So in something that's probably never happened in the history of film, we spoke to her agent one day. He got her the script that evening. She called back the next morning, told him she wanted to do it. I was on a plane the next day and we had lunch the day I arrived in LA and decided, yes, we were gonna work together. So I think that was whatever it was, three days. And she told me at one point that she woke up one day, I don't remember how old she said she was, but she decided she was going to be kind to everyone. And I thought that's a remarkable thing because I've always thought that I had the ability to use a velvet whip. I've done an enormous amount of directing in the theater and being captain of my teams and president of my class. And I thought I, I can relate to that. I don't think you have to yell. I don't think you have to, to mistreat or be nasty or lorded over people to get them to work well with you. And she was true to her word. She was so kind to everyone that when she walked on the set, she was just another member of the group. And she was so kind to the kids who were working on the movie to say nothing of the people she was acting with or me, that I think she really created an atmosphere more than anybody else that was extremely giving and generous. She and uh, Chris Payne Gilbert came out a week early to rehearse. We rehearsed just like we would in the theater. We sat, again, right behind you in that room at a table. We rehearsed. Uh, Amy Lanasa, who plays a featured role in the movie, and Doyle Smith, who plays a featured role, live here in Las Cruces. They were available. We rehearsed all those scenes. So by the time we were on the set, Chris Payne Gilbert and Linda Hamilton were very comfortable together. We'd done an enormous amount of the input talking, debating, a lot of refining, rewriting, tweaking, so that when we got on the set, we could speak in code and go. Now, Chris Payne Gilbert is a theater trained actor. He loved to talk after every take. And if, if I invited him, we'd have a five, minute chat and then he'd do something entirely different. And sometimes I'd have to say, okay, we, we've got to quit, no more, we can't talk, we can't talk. Let's do this or let's do that. With Linda, I got to the point very quickly where I would just look at her and say, how was that for you? If she said good, I trusted that. She would do the same with me. If I thought something was okay, even if she thought she might want to do it again, I thought it was fine, we'd go, shorthand. These are extraordinary actors, uh, Linda and Chris, and then Chris McDonald, who is an incredibly instinctive actor, just gives it to you like that. And if you ask him to give you something else, he'll give you something entirely different, just like that. And Lena Jorgis is another theater trained actor who did an incredible amount of preparation and we talked a lot on the phone. She came in a few days early so that whenever possible we would chat. She got to know everybody in the cast she'd be working with just hanging around the set. And I think it was like having a, a little stable of Porsches and I would turn the ignition on and uh, rev them up and turn them loose. Slam them in gear, go. There's an interesting tone to this film where violence and drama are intertwined with quirky comedy and religion. 
What were your intentions for the tone of the film and did you achieve them? E.B. White once said that, the, uh, that one's style is the sound that one's words make on paper. Well, I think the same thing is true in spoken dialogue. I'm not sure you can plan it, but I do know that from a very young age, I have had a tendency or an ability to make people laugh at things that weren't funny on the face of them. So I don't really think about it. I think I have a very dark view of the world, yet I have great love for the people around me and the people I write about. So some combination of that darkness and affection and love for the people I write about in this case creates a certain odd kind of intimate humor. There are some controversial allusions to religion in this film, i.e. a religious priest being an adulterer and a drug addict. What was your purpose for portraying religion in this way and why? A lot of that is spontaneous. I'm, I, I'm not someone who has a lot of positive feeling for organized religion. I think the atrocities that have been committed in the names of various deities are extraordinary across history, the history of our species. So I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of organized religion, but at the same time, I created a character in Linda who is very quietly religious. And I created somebody in her husband who was a bad faith minister. So I feel like in a way I balanced the two. I didn't really set out to overbalance to one side or the other. Again, as I said earlier, I think the important thing is that I put myself into those characters and just try to make them real. And not everybody is nice. And not everybody has a deity that belongs in one of our various universal faiths. <laughs>